Hi, I'm Terry Fairbanks, and my goal in this module is going to tell you about why it matters to integrate human factors engineering and system safety engineering into healthcare. My early professional years was working as a human factors engineering, doing system safety engineering in other complex high-risk industries. Then later on, my love for EMS actually brought me into healthcare and I became a physician and I continue to work in the emergency medicine environment where, as you know in healthcare, we see that we all work under adversity in a very difficult, complex system every day. And when you contrast the way that we try to do healthcare safety with the way other industries have integrated system safety engineering and human factors into their safety programs, you see why we're not getting safer. What we're going to tell you about in this module is a basic introduction to why system safety engineering and human factors is important in healthcare and give you some examples that really help you visualize what we're talking about. As we've all heard before, the most dangerous part of an airline trip is the drive to the airport by factors of 10. But did you ever think about the fact that the most dangerous part of a trip to the hospital is being in the hospital, not the drive to the hospital? It is almost as dangerous as bungee jumping to be a patient in a hospital. And we've known this for years. Back in the late 80s, we started to develop data that showed that medical error is very prominent and we're making a lot of mistakes in healthcare and where our adverse event rates are really high. And when the report came out in the year 2000, it changed the way we thought about safety in healthcare. We started to have more government funding. We started having people in the C-suite that were, that were just responsible for safety and quality. And it became a prominent issue in the press and with the general public thinking about safety in healthcare. Yet, years later, decades later, really, we've had minimal change. If you look at the statistics, we are not getting safer in healthcare. So the question is why? If we've had so much of a focus on safety over all this time, why are we not getting safer? When you talk to system safety engineers that work outside of healthcare and other high-risk critical in industries, they'll say that it's because we have our approach wrong. For years, we've been really trying to focus on the human error in healthcare as the cause of our problems. We think that if we can fix human error and make people stop making mistakes, that we will become safer as an industry. But we have to look at it differently. We have to think of it as reducing harm. And in a complex socio-technical system like healthcare is, we are never going to be able to totally eliminate human error. If you think about it, in fact, one of the first things you learned from your parents when you were two or three years old as an early, early value that we learn, it's all humans make mistakes. And you can't take the human out of healthcare. Now, when I say this, sometimes people think that we're talking about hiring a workforce of people in healthcare that are complacent and not vigilant and don't care and not well trained and that's not at all what we're talking about. System safety engineers who work in complex environments have an assumption that they have really well selected, smart, well trained, capable, competent people working in their system and that those people will still make errors. And that's true in healthcare. If you think about it across all professions, healthcare is one of the most standardized, well-trained, well-selected professions that there are. People take board exams that have very, very high standards and there's annual competencies and continuing medical education that keep us up to date. Yet in that environment of highly trained, competent people, we still have normal human error. And if you're going to design a system to remain safe, you have to focus on mitigating adverse events in the face of that normal human error. That's what we're going to talk about during my session today. So the goal to eliminate human error is actually a futile way to reduce safety events. And other complex industries know this and have designed it for years. We know in aviation in the early 70s, they stopped trying to focus on pilot error as a cause, and instead they started thinking about what the system contributions are that allow pilot error to result in a, in a plane crash. And now, years later, we hardly ever see airplanes crash, in, especially in the United States, in the major carriers where we have very, very high-profile safety programs. So the idea that human error cannot be eliminated no matter what allows us to realize that the, the decades past approach to patient safety of eliminating human error is a futile goal. 
But even more importantly, what this feudal goal does is it misdirects our resources. If you think about the way we've done this in healthcare for years, the people who are responsible for safety are spending 90 to 95 percent of their professional time chasing adverse events after they occur. What we need to do is transition to a more proactive approach that starts to figure out where the human error occurs so we can mitigate the error before it causes an adverse event. The bottom line is that this is about reducing harm. System safety engineering has a lot of disciplines, but one that's gotten a lot of attention in, in healthcare, and one of the reasons you're watching this module is because you're interested in human factors engineering. And I want to say one thing at the very outset, in that human factors engineering is not about redesigning humans. Human factors engineers redesign the system within which humans work. And this has been a common misconception, actually, in healthcare. In fact, sometimes I'll get calls from people saying, I have this problem surgeon, I need your help figuring out how to fix him or her. And that's not what we do in human factors. What we do is we study data, scientific data, on behavior and cognition, human limitations, characteristics, physical traits, and performance characteristics, and then design the system and the devices and the system components and tools and machines and processes to fit those human characteristics. What this does is it results in, in a safer and more efficient and more productive system. One problem that we've had traditionally in healthcare is that there tends to be this gap between the way managers believe that work is done at the ground level and the way it's really done on a day-to-day -day basis. And traditionally in safety, we think if there's a gap there that this means that the people doing workarounds, for example, are not doing their job well or right. And one way to look at safety proactively with more of a resilience focus is to think that the people at the front lines that are doing things a little differently, maybe that's because they have to, because of the constraints that are involved. And what we need to do is think of workarounds as a red flag for a big gap between work as imagined and work as performed. What we're going to talk about today is the way to look at the ground level work that's being done, the human performance that's involved, and then design the system and the processes and the rules to minimize that gap so that it actually matches the abilities of human performance. Now, I've talked a little bit about the philosophy. Now what I want to do is bring it down to earth with an example. And most of you probably are familiar enough with healthcare to know that defibrillation is one of the things that we do where every second counts. In fact, in the emergency medicine environment where I work, it's one of the few things where we really rush around. When somebody's heart stops, they're usually in a rhythm that can be shocked back into a normal heartbeat. But the problem is that for every minute that goes by from the time of the heart stopping until the time you shock, there's 10% less chance of resuscitating this patient. So this is truly a time when every second counts. So let's look at this case that happens over and over again, but this one case example that I'll give you. Let's say a patient is in the hospital, they're being monitored, they go into cardiac arrest right in front of the nurse. The nurse does all the right things, goes and gets the defibrillator, charges the unit, and then looks around, says clear, and then presses the button to shock. But let's say in this case, the nurse presses the on button, as you see here, instead of the shock button. What happens then? Well, in a normal defibrillator made today, it just shuts down. I want you to compare that to what you do when you use a slide projector and you accidentally press the power button when you, mean to not, when you don't mean to shut it down. What happens to that slide projector? It gives you an announcement and it says, do you really want to shut me down? Why is the slide projector doing that? Well, because the consumer electronics developer that developed that device knew from studying that a normal error mode for normal mode of human error in the users of their devices would be to inadvertently press the power button. And they're trying to protect the user from an adverse event, the adverse event being shutting down the slide projector prematurely. And if you think about it, you really can't hurt a patient by sl shutting a slide projector down prematurely. So why is it in healthcare then that when you can hurt a patient by shutting a defibrillator down prematurely, Think about the fact that when you shut it down, it takes two to three minutes to start up again. So that's two to 20 to 30 percent less chance of resuscitating this patient who's just died in front of you. Yet if you make this error, it just shuts down. 
think about the fact that we could easily build in a protection that says, do you really want to shut me down? Particularly in a defibrillator that's just been charged, and when it's just been charged, it kind of implies a patient has gone into cardiac arrest in front of you, that would be a good time for us to design the device to mitigate that potential error. And when you hear the story, you think, well, that's, you know, maybe a new user, somebody who hasn't used a defibrillator. But what we find in studies is that most common errors like that occur with users who are very used to using the defibrillator because they are what we call a skills-based or automated mode, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. And you see that the skills-based error where slips and lapses occur is the most common error mode for people to make. And this is what I call automation error. In healthcare, we tend to think of skills-based as technical skills, like IVs and intubation and central lines. But that's not what we're talking about here. This is just a coincidence that the name sounds familiar. What we're talking about in skills-based error is error that happens in something that you're doing while you're not thinking about the details of it, what we call automation mode. It's the kind of error that occurs when you get home, and like you do every day, you put your keys on the counter and one day you don't put them on the counter and you're not thinking about where you put your car keys and you, and you lose your car keys. That's a skills-based um, error. Well, this is an important area to look in healthcare because this is one of the most common types of errors that occur in healthcare that leads to adverse event. Maybe mixing up two medication bottles and we'll talk about some examples to bring that more clear. The thing that's special about this kind of error, slips and lapses or automation error or skills-based error, is that things like policies and in-services, discipline, training, vigilance, having a mindful moment, none of these interventions actually change the underlying skills-based error rate. So we're not making ourselves any safer if our response to a skills-based error is to provide one of these interventions. Looking at the individual and saying you should have done it better is not going to make us safer tomorrow. What's going to make us safer tomorrow is figuring out what the performance characteristics are so we know where we can anticipate those errors occurring and then mitigating the system so that one of two things happens. Either that error cannot occur because of different processes that we've put in place to lock out the potential for the error, or the error can occur, but it's mitigated so it doesn't lead to an adverse event. Those are the two good ways to mitigate uh, skills-based error. We had this answer in the year 2000 when the IOM report came out, and it was titled To Air is Human. That game changer report understood that we need to develop system solutions to become safer. Yet today, you'll see papers and articles and interventions and RCA reports that show that in healthcare we still fail to understand this concept. And this is where human factors and the system safety engineering approach can really help. It's a huge opportunity for us to focus on skills-based error. And in your health system, as you're doing adverse event reports, RCAs, or hazard analyses trying to figure out where the problems are, think about where the skills-based errors are. If you see skills-based errors occurring or automation errors in your providers and nurses and physicians and pharmacists and other, other healthcare professionals, then instead of thinking about trying to educate them, make them more vigilant, tell them to have mindful moments, you should be thinking about how you can mitigate those so that they can occur and not injure a patient. I'll give you another defibrillator example. When we did a usability study looking at these kinds of issues around defibrillators, we found that in 50% of the time that we set up a scenario for two subsequent synchronized cardioversions, the second time the user had the device in the wrong mode. And we found that that's probably because the device changed modes during the first shock without notifying the provider. So when we published this report, we also notified the provider that this was an issue. And one of the manufacturers wrote us back and said that the preventative corrective action is provided in the device labeling. So I want to think about this and I want to use this as an example to talk about approaches to system safety engineering. Let's talk about how effective device labeling is, and especially in a skills-based mode. And I'm going to use an everyday example for you to understand what I'm talking about. This is something that came from one of the earliest books um, which is called The Design of Everyday Things, focusing on the design of a door handle. 
So picture this door handle I'm showing you in the picture right now, and think about what a normal person would do as they approach that door when they're not thinking about what to do. They would pull on the door, of course, because the pull handle is a much, much more powerful communicator with the person to tell them what to do than the sign that's right in front of their face. This push sign that's in front of their face is device labeling intervention in an attempt to overcome bad design. A good design of a door would have a push plate. Be this works for two reasons. One is there's this underlying cognitive feed of information to the person approaching the door to tell them that the way to use the door is to push on it rather than to pull on it. The second is, if you look at this design, it's actually impossible to pull to open the door. So you actually lock out the potential for the error to occur. When we're in skills-based mode, we don't stop and think about how to open a door as we approach the door. We don't think about the fact that when we came to the door 10 minutes ago to come into the room, that it opened out, and so it must push to go out. We're not thinking about the fact that the sign says push. What's communicating with us the most is the design of the door, because we're not thinking about how to use the door. Let's relate that whole concept to healthcare. Think about these examples that happen over and over and over again, where by a normal process of normal errors that occur in the process, the wrong drug is loaded into the automated drug dispensing machine. When this happens, a nurse goes to the automated drug dis dispensing machine asking for a certain medication, gets out what they think they've asked for, they look at it, it's the wrong medication, but because of bad coincidence and bad design, the bottle, the vial, and the color of the labeling and everything looks the same. And even though that nurse is being vigilant and doing their five rights and they've looked at it, they see what they expect to see. This is a normal error and you can see in this example uh, and several others, you can see how this would allow us to move on to an adverse event without any intervention. One famous case in this is the mix-up of heparin. And it's happened over and over throughout the United States. Uh, in one case, I think the worst number of fatalities at once um, happened in a hospital in Indianapolis where um, the pharmacy tech put the wrong heparin, the much more concentrated heparin, into the automated drug dispensing machine in the NICU. And five different NICU nurses um, delivered the dose, the wrong dose, the high concentration dose, to six different babies. Three of them died, and three of them had permanent injuries. And two things are worth saying about that case. One is that that hospital responded to it in a very good way with the CEO in a press conference that same day saying, we don't know what happened today, but we do know that it's a system problem, and we take responsibility, and we'll get down to the problems, and we'll fix them. It's not an individual blame issue. So this was, this was a very early, very progressive way for a leader to handle this. Um, secondly, the, um, the drug wasn't recalled. When we saw how the same vial with the same color labeling um, was getting mixed up time after time after time, the intervention was not to recall the drug. And so what happened is this, this happened again, and it happened in a very famous case with many of you may know, and that is with Dennis Quaid's children when Dennis and his wife uh, went in and delivered twins that were in the NICU for a little while, this same mix-up occurred. And you can see how looking at the nurse and the individual issues in one hospital certainly doesn't help us be safer in another hospital. When you think about the logic of this, you can, you can relate it back to the door or any other skills-based skills -based issue, because we have here two vials, one of which is only ever allowed to be delivered as an IV drip. So it has to be mixed first with a bag. And yet we use the same vial for preparation that feels, looks the same, it's the exact same size with the same color labeling for a drug that nurses give day in and day out directly into the line. So by having the same vial, the look and feel, we've completely eliminated the potential for a nurse to recover from the error when they're delivered the wrong medication. Lucian Leap once said, the single greatest impediment to error prevention in the medical industry is that we punish people for making mistakes. And I think this is one really important thing that we need to think about as we try to apply human factors engineering and system safety to healthcare, is that any time an error occurs, we have to be thinking, not why did that person make the error, but why could anybody like them make the error? And instead of thinking, let's fix it so this never happens again, we, can, we should be thinking, 
if that person made an error once, then somebody like them in another hospital or in another unit or in another age will make the same mistake again. And in order to do this, we have to improve the culture of safety. Right now, our culture still in many healthcare organizations is that when people have near misses or they make a mistake that doesn't injure a patient, they suppress that knowledge. They don't want to talk about it to their peers or their supervisor because they internalize it and feel like they've failed. Studies that have been around in other high, complex high-risk high industries for years have shown that about 600 near misses and um, almost events occur for every event that injures somebody. So if you apply those data to healthcare, you think we have 600 opportunities to learn about a potential hazard, a potential to injure a patient before we actually injure a patient. That's why safety culture is so important because we need our frontline providers to be thinking, gee, if I could make that mistake, and if I almost hurt a patient just now, this could happen to somebody else. It's not because I'm a bad nurse or bad doctor, it's just that it could happen to somebody else. And then we need to get people talking about it, reporting it, and that allows us to then find trends in safety problems and prioritize what we fix. Obviously, we can't fix every hazard that we come to, but we need to find the hazards that are most likely to have a devastating injury to a patient and the ones that are most likely to occur. In order to do this, we have to shift our prevention to a more proactive mode. I like to use the analogy to when we, in the 70s, changed the way we tried to fix heart disease. We used to wait till somebody had a heart attack, and then we'd mitigate their symptoms and have them have the best quality of life that we could. In the early 70s, particularly after the Framingham trial, in healthcare, we really started thinking, Early on, we're going to do what we call primary prevention of heart disease, and we're going to try to counsel our patients when they're young to not develop risk factors, not start smoking, not develop risk factors that will have them get diabetes, which leads to heart disease, if they have high blood pressure, control their high blood pressure, etc. All that is called primary prevention of heart disease. Then secondary prevention was having our primary care doctors do an increased amount of um, of surveillance so they could identify people who have existing risk factors for heart disease that could be modified before the heart attack occurs. Tertiary prevention, of course, as I said, is waiting till the heart attack occurs. So let's use that model and apply it to healthcare. And this will kind of give you an idea of the proactive way to do system safety engineering in healthcare. Tertiary prevention is what we're already pretty good at in healthcare, although we could get better, and that is waiting till there's an adverse event. The ways that we can do tertiary care better is after the adverse event, we need to be much better about immediately, in a transparent way, disclosing what happened to the patients and their families so that they know immediately, even if they wouldn't have known otherwise, letting them know that this error occurred and supporting them. Secondly, we need to immediately support our providers because remember, none of our providers come to work to injure a patient, and almost all the time they're doing everything possible to be the safest providers possible. So they're often devastated by these events too, and we need to care for them. The third thing we need to do is an immediate response, where we go to the scene almost right away in that culture of safety where people feel comfortable telling us about it. We have an immediate response. We can do things like get the EKG strips out of the garbage can and things that just normally people wouldn't think would be important so that we can really figure out the system factors that led to that adverse event. If we do all those things better, we can learn better from our adverse events and we can prevent further things happening again and also similar things happening. That's better tertiary prevention. But where the money really is, I think, is being better at primary and secondary prevention, and in particular secondary prevention. So primary prevention in safety is designing our systems to reduce error in the first place, meaning understanding human performance characteristics, where our people are most apt to make mistakes, and then design the system, the devices, the IT systems to minimize the occurrence of that error. Secondary prevention, I think, if, if you really want to make a difference in the next five years in your organization, focus on secondary prevention and focus on applying human factors and system safety engineering to your health system. And here's what secondary prevention is. That is developing systems that help us identify where the hazards are before we've injured patients. And then prioritizing, as I said before, 
prioritizing fixes, and mitigating the system so that we do not have adverse events. Some ways to monitor this are hazard reporting. And by hazard reporting, I don't mean an event reporting system where people only report events and it gets sent immediately to supervisors and leadership. What I mean is develop a culture where your providers tell you about hazards that they encounter every day in their workplace. Every day, you know this, every day you go to a unit and you talk to the frontline providers that are working and they can tell you where they're feeling unsafe that day. Every day they have hazards they encounter and near misses they encounter. And we, as the system designers, need to learn about these so that we can put in place mitigations that will help that. Another way to be better at secondary prevention and monitoring is using good catches, because usually good catches mean that at the last minute somebody almost had an adverse event occur and they report it, and they report it as a good catch. And that can be a way that we can learn where the hazards are. The third way is during your RCA reviews and your event reviews, expand the scope so that when you're in the system doing interviews and talking to people, you're also trying to learn about other existing hazards, one that's, ones that did not even apply um, to that or, or contribute to that adverse event. And finally, patient complaints is a really important yet untapped area for us to learn about where existing hazards are. The patients don't always wrap it up in a bow and tell us where the hazards are, but often their complaints are going to give us good indicators into places we're not doing well in terms of safety. So if we take all those surveillance methods and others to try to learn where our existing hazards are, and then we prioritize and try to mitigate those problems by putting system fixes in place, we will become safer as a health system. One industry that's done really well at this and is a great analogy is the aviation industry. Now often when people hear us talk about aviation industry, they like to say we're different and they think it doesn't apply. But as a former pilot and as somebody who's done a lot of work in safety and in aviation, I can tell you that the concepts all apply to healthcare. Yes, we apply them in a different way, but, but they all apply to healthcare. And I'll give you a couple examples. But I'll talk first about the statistics. And think about today's aviation world. We fly 30,000 flights per day, yet we essentially never crash airplanes. And there's a recent study that shows that pilots and air traffic controllers make an average of two errors per hour. So that shows you we're not crashing airplanes, yet they're making errors. That shows you how good the system fixes are in aviation that have led us to have such a safe system. One way that they do that is secondary prevention. And the aviation industry has many ways in place, many monitoring methods in place, to try to learn about where the hazards are. One important concept that we have not done well in healthcare yet is that they have created a protective environment so their pilots, air traffic controllers, mechanics, and other workers who otherwise might feel like their jobs or licenses are at risk feel protected when they pr report a safety event. What that does is it creates this large feed of information that helps them determine where their hazards are. One example from the former um, airline US Airways was the, this following um, policy that they have, and my understanding is that all the major airlines have a similar policy. And it says, US Airways will not in initiate disciplinary proceedings against any employee who discloses an incident or occurrence involving flight safety. Think about that. That means that the airlines have said it's much more important for us to learn where the system problems are than to identify the occasional person who we want to focus on. They've said that, and this is, these are Jeff Skiles' words, the miracle on the Hudson first officer, it is vastly more important to identify the hazards and threats to safety than to identify and punish an individual for mistake. And that is because they know that their individuals are well-selected, well-trained, they come to work every day to do the best job they can. And yes, there is a rare exception to that, but those rare exceptions will be identified in an administrative process, not in the safety program. They also say, we exchange the ability to reprimand an individual for the ability to gain greater knowledge. This is a really important concept in understanding how system safety engineer can help us as a health system. So I want to give you another example that kind of shows how we did it wrong in the first place and then we did it better the next time from a system safety engineering standpoint. And set the scene for a patient who comes into the emergency department with hypoglycemia or low blood sugar as an outpatient. But 
they get glucose on the way in by the ambulance. So once they arrive in the ER, all their labs are showing high glucose. But they get admitted to the hospital for glucose monitoring, and during the first day of their stay, the patient eats all of her meals, she eats her snacks, and she feels well. And um, later in the afternoon, when she's not feeling so well, the, the long-time diabetic says to the nurse on a diabetic floor, I know my blood sugar, and I am not low right now. But the nurse says, I got to check your blood sugar anyway, checks her blood sugar. And the nurse interprets the reading as critically high. So the nurse does all the appropriate things given that reading, gives standing order sliding scale glu uh, insulin. Then when it's still showing critical high, calls the internist on call who orders more insulin over the phone. The patient eventually bottoms out their glucose and has to be admitted to the ICU and, and intubated um, because of uh, low blood sugar. Later the next day, the nurse is called in because the management had looked at the uh, glucose readings as they came back as numbers uh, from, from the lab system, and they had all been hypoglycemia the entire time it had been low blood glucose. So initially, they focused on blaming the nurse. They suspended the nurse, and in the meantime, on another floor, different unit, two weeks later, the same event occurs. And at that point, this hospital takes a step back and says, two nurses made the same error, let's look a little more closely at it. And through simulation, looking at what occurs when a low blood sugar occur, uh, happens, they determined that the interface design of the glucometer actually misled the nurses. And you can see here, here's a picture of the actual glu glucometer showing for a critical value, it says repeat lab draw for greater than 600. And it covers up most of the message behind that says low, L-O. And so you can see how the nurse misinterpreted this as a high glucose. In the end, there's other contributing factors when you look at this case that could lead to a normal human error here. One is that this critically low value, when we looked back at data in this hospital out of the last 80,000 glucometer readings in that particular hospital, only 119 or 0.1% were critically low. So the nurses were not used to seeing this. And the vast majority of those occurred in the emergency department where the patient came in that way. Hypoglycemia is a never event we're pretty darn good at in healthcare. We rarely have hypoglycemia events, so the nurses are not used to seeing the glucometer reading, nor are they trained in it. In fact, the uh, glucometer brand that we used didn't even have uh, fluid available to test critically low. They had the, the test fluid available for high and for low, but not critically low. So the nurses had no way to experience this except in real time. When we looked back at it, we found that out of six hospitals in the system, there were six different messages that occurred during this critically low. Um, and some of them were confusing and some were not. Here are a couple examples I'm showing here. But you can see how the implementation of the device when it came to the hospital and each lab manager decided what the critical message should say contributed to this problem. So there are lots of contributions beyond the normal human error. So, we see now that this was a normal human error, and what is really important message about this is that the message that it delivered to the rest of the nursing staff and the hospital in general when this nurse was disciplined for what others could see was a normal error. And we have a quick four-minute video to show you that describes the culture piece of this, and you're going to meet the nurse involved. And she's going to tell you, and you're going to see how she felt when she was disciplined, and then later how she felt after the proper event review was done, and they figured out that the, um, that the nurse had had a normal error, and they actually reversed her discipline, which sent a really nice message. And I think you'll enjoy seeing, from the nurse's perspective, um, how, how she was affected and how the culture is affected. <laughs> patient care technician came to me and she told me I need to let you see this screen and she showed me the glucometer. She saw the word high flash on the screen and that's what she assumed was the result that she had. She's like I just feel like my blood sugar is really high. She's like I just feel I don't feel good I know my body. And so there wasn't really any suspicion that it would be low and so when this error message comes up it kind of confirmed that. So we rechecked her 
um, blood sugar and the same the same thing popped up. So I, I covered her with some insulin and I called the physician. And by the time I got her back in bed, she became like non-responsive. Ended up being a rapid response and requiring a transfer of the patient to the intensive care unit. The nurse had um, misread the glucometer and called the physician, asked for insulin on multiple occasions, and the patient had a severe hypoglycemic event and had to go to the ICU before it was caught. During the rapid response, we checked the glucose twice, I believe, and the same thing kept popping up, the screen that said glucose greater than 600. The next day is when I received the call that the whole time her blood sugar was actually critically low. Shortly after this particular incident, another nurse made the same error where the machine gave, it was an actual low value, but the machine read off this alert saying for a high, do X, Y, and Z. It never came to mind that the glucometer was incorrect. It was probably the worst experience I've ever had in my professional career. It's good hearing from Annie and good to see how this affects the culture when we handle these things in a disciplinary matter. matter. And by the way, if you want to use this video, it is available on YouTube and you can, you're welcome to use this um, to, in your own organizations to try to demonstrate this concept. Lucian Leap once said, the single greatest impediment to error prevention in the medical industry is that we punish people for making mistakes. And I think that Annie really has shown us how we're not getting safer um, by punishing her after that normal error that occurred. In order to change the culture, we really have to set up a way to respond to adverse events and hazards and, and, and human error that we, that we see. And we do need to have a system of accountability within healthcare, like any profession. And as I said earlier, we are a highly accountable profession. We have high standards to get into our professional schools. We have high standards to maintain our certifications and our licensure and continuing education. And people hold themselves and each other to a very, very high standard. Yet very rarely, maybe once a year or once every couple years in a, in a big system, you will have egregious, reckless behavior that's deliberate. Now, there can, you have to be very careful because often after an adverse event when a patient's injured, in hindsight, using hindsight bias, after we see all the things they should have known, it can seem egregious. But we're not talking about things that seem like they should have seen it or they should have known. That's not egregious. Egregious is when you deliberately are reckless, deliberately allowing yourself to injure a patient. And you need in your system to have some kind of a just culture policy that lets people know that there is a line that's drawn so that there's a system of accountability, but also so people know that they're going to be handled fairly and well when they have a normal error or when they have an error around what we call at-risk behavior. Now, at-risk behavior is when there may be a shortcut, uh, a workaround, or doing something that in retrospect, after a patient's been injured, may seem like it was inappropriate. The reason we need to support people and not discipline them in this at-risk behavior category is because otherwise two things happen. One is we reduce the culture to more of a secretive environment and we're not learning about where our, our, our hazards are. But the second thing is we fail to learn about the system contribution to that particular event because we're focusing on the person. Most of the time when there's a workaround or there's at-risk behavior or something that's a little outside of the process, what we really need to do is look at why why that person did things a little differently. And often what we'll find is there are constraints that weren't known at the time of the policy development, for example, that have led to somebody having to do it differently. In healthcare, one of the ways we stay safe is because our people are resilient. And this whole idea of human resilience means we have to allow people to make quick decisions and judgments. If everyone always did everything exactly according to policy, we would actually have a meltdown. One thing, if you're interested more in this topic, that I recommend is Sidney Decker's book on just culture. Um, and I'll, actually, any of Sidney's book are, books are really easy reads that help you understand this system safety engineering and human factors approach to safety. So to do this well, we have to develop sustainable solutions, develop effective solutions. We need to understand where our hazards are and then to develop the solutions in context to narrow that gap between work as imagined and work as performed. We need to really focus on the hazards that are existing in our health system, not the individuals who are the victims of those hazards because they have normal errors occur. 
The safety problem is not bad people, bad providers, bad nurses, incompetence, carelessness, lack of accountability. That is not the reason that we're not getting safer in healthcare. The reason we're not getting safer in healthcare is because we're approaching it wrong. We have a complex, messy system. We have often inadequate design of our health IT systems, our medical devices, processes, culture. And we have role-based teams that often aren't taught to work well as teams together. The healthcare safety problem is not bad people. We have good, well-trained, well-intentioned people that come to work every day to do a great job, and we still are injuring patients every day in the United States in our health system. And if you look at the data, we're not getting safer. Einstein once said, continuing to do the same thing and expecting different results is the definition of insanity. And that's what we've been doing for the last couple decades in healthcare. As leaders, there are three things you can do. One is shift your focus from tertiary prevention after the event occurs to putting more of your time and resources into primary and secondary prevention, meaning understand where your hazards are in the health system and work hard to mitigate them so we don't injure patients. The second is to take the steps necessary to implement a just culture policy within your organization and start the change necessary for people to feel safe telling you about the hazards. And this, ha this change has to start with senior leaders, but it has to be understood by frontline leaders, and more importantly, it has to be understood by the frontline providers. We at the frontline are the, one, the ones that when we encounter a hazard, instead of internalizing it and say, I really screwed up, I'm so stupid, we have to say, gee, someone else could make this mistake, I need to let people know. And the third is, formally implement an event review process that's based on safety science that uses some of these smart ways of figuring out where the normal error is or the at-risk behavior, and instead of focusing on the individual as a problem, focus on the system and the components that led that person to be able to make that error, or that failed to mitigate the error after it occurred. Two things that I'll point out that have come out recently that I think are good tools to help you with that is the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or AHRQ's new CANDOR tool, and the National Patient Safety Foundation's new RCA squared tool. Both of them are available at these links that we're showing here. Fallibility is part of the human condition. We cannot change the human condition, but we can change the conditions under which people work. James Reason said this many, many years ago, and as soon as we understand this in healthcare, we will start to see our plateau reduce and we will become safer. Thank you very much, and I hope that this has given you an idea of why human factors and system safety engineering is important in healthcare.